Having a loose and relaxed wrist is often used as the magical solution to various problems with your tennis technique. Mainly, when players come to me, they think that the serve and the forehand can benefit greatly from having a loose and relaxed wrist. Interestingly, nobody really talks about having a loose wrist on the volleys or on the one-handed backhand or even on the two-handed backhand or on the overhead. There it's pretty obvious that, for example, on the volley, we can benefit from holding the racket a little bit tighter. We can provide more stability at the moment of contact. However, on the serve and the forehand, the reason why most people think a loose and relaxed wrist is beneficial is that on the serve, for example, people think that having a racket drop with a loose wrist will make the racket drop lower. And also a loose wrist will allow players to pronate into the contact and then continue to pronate. On the other hand, on the forehand, players believe that having a loose wrist will generate a wrist lag a la Roger Federer. So in today's video, I want to show you that number one, a loose wrist will not guarantee certain technical elements to take place on your strokes. And also, it's quite the contrary. The wrist is actually not as loose on high level players as you think it is. So let's start off with the wrist lag on the forehand. So what happens with the wrist lag is that when we accelerate forward after sequencing our torso rotation, where we lead the way with our non-dominant side, the arm is finally going to start going forward and we're going to be pulling that racket towards the contact. What will happen naturally is that the wrist will lag behind. Now, some players on the ATP Tour will close the racket face upon the racket drop. And now, the reason why the wrist lag is so visible is that the racket will flip from this position to this position. This is very easy to observe when we watch slow motion footage. However, we cannot see this in real time. So naturally, players want to imitate this and they start becoming very wristy with their forehands. And they're also very loose when they try to make the wrist lag happen at the conscious level. So I'm going to try what many recreational players have tried before. I'm going to close the strings upon the racket drop and then I'm going to, with a loose wrist, make my racket go back this way. Take a look what happens. So here I'm going to close my strings and I'm going to be extremely wristy making that wrist slag happen a la Roger Federer. You can see there that the wrist is so sloppy. It is so loose that I have absolutely no stability at the moment of contact. And this is what I want you guys to understand. The most important thing on the forehand is the contact point. If you're too loose when you make contact with the ball, you will start spraying the ball and you will have absolutely no control. So naturally what needs to happen when we meet the ball, the wrist needs to be in an extended position so that it can provide maximum stability to the racket head when we meet the ball. So there are two options on the forehand. We can set this position in place prior to the racket drop. And this is what many elite tennis players do. So basically we're gonna extend the wrist backwards in the same position that we will get into when we make contact. So we can set this immediately. And now naturally, as we go through the motion on our forehand, the wrist will lag behind. You can see that the acceleration of the racket forward will make the wrist lag behind even further. So naturally, even with a set position of the wrist prior to the acceleration phase, the wrist will still lag behind further from the acceleration. So this is very easy to see because if you take a look from any high level player from behind, you will see that on the forehand, when the racket starts to accelerate, the tip of the racket is not pointing straight towards the back fence, it's actually pointing towards the side because the acceleration is making the wrist lag further behind. Now, a lot of players find more comfort in being a little bit more relaxed with the wrist prior to the acceleration phase, and there's nothing wrong with being relaxed prior to the acceleration phase. You could easily have the wrist straight a la Andy Murray, drop the racket down, but now just be aware that there's gonna be more movement in the wrist when we start accelerating from this position. So does this require wrist movement? It doesn't require any wrist movement at the conscious level. Yes, the wrist will be more relaxed as you drop in the racket, but naturally, as you accelerate the stroke, even from this position, the wrist will extend backwards and you will naturally achieve more stability at the moment of contact. Here are some facts about wrist extension. So basically, when we make contact on the forehand, our wrist is going to be extended. And what most people associate with relaxation is when we let the wrist flex down. This is how we relax the wrist. This is how our muscles are relaxed. And naturally, when we extend the wrist upwards, you can see that the muscles are flexing. They're not very big. My muscles used to be bigger. I don't train anymore, but you can see that as soon as I extend my hands upwards, you can see there's flexion 
in these muscles. So what that means is once we lag the racket behind, naturally the wrist will extend. And what happens when we extend the wrist, these forearm muscles are slightly flexed and this is not a relaxed position at all. Naturally, there is some control required on the forward phase of the swing. If your arm is too loose, especially the wrist, you will not be able to accelerate fast enough and overall the contact is going to be too sloppy. So naturally on the forehand, this is true for any high level player, as the wrist lags back, there is more tension applied to the forearm, providing the entire forehand stroke with more stability. Now, once you have hit the ball on the forehand, you get to about this point, this is where you can activate your wrist and a lot of professional players do that. And it's perfectly safe to do so. But what you absolutely have to avoid is being loose once the racket has dropped and then being loose at the contact. This will not only hurt your control, but it can also cause some injuries because as the wrist is wildly moving around at a very high speed, remember that forehands are accelerated up to 100 miles an hour at the elite level, this will be very difficult for the wrist to handle. The wrist is a very fra fragile joint. It's a very weak part of the human body. It is absolutely impossible that the wrist will be able to sustain speeds up to 100 miles an hour. Therefore, naturally, this extension of the wrist provides the arm with needed stability to be able to handle such fast acceleration. A lot of players come to me and they think that having a loose and relaxed wrist on the serve will make their racket drop lower and will also allow them to pronate into the contact. So this is absolutely not true. A sufficiently low racket drop like you see at the high levels where the tip of the racket goes below your lower back will only be there if you possess the right fundamentals and if you have a lot of acceleration in your serve. And the same goes for the pronation into the contact and the continuing pronation. And a loose wrist will absolutely not guarantee that you're going to accomplish these things. Now, you got to remember that the serve accelerates even faster than the forehand and the same rules apply for the serve that apply for the forehand. We need to provide the arm with more stability and there's wrist extension involved in the racket drop. If you take a look at any high level serve, you will see that the wrist slightly extends on the racket drop. This is true for all high level serves. You will not see a racket drop with wrist flexion. In other words, you will not see something like this where the wrist is flexed and the racket is kind of going over the head and into the back. This is way too loose and you would not be able to get number one, high acceleration and you wouldn't be able to be accurate. In other words, this type of racket drop will be way too sloppy and this is why you don't see it at the high level. So what happens on the racket drop is the following. The wrist slightly extends and now there's two options. The racket can drop with an open racket face or it can drop on edge. In both of these circumstances, the wrist is slightly extended. And again, this is done by the body naturally to be able to provide more control with the extremely high acceleration. And the same is true for the pronation into the contact. The wrist is still extended when the racket is approaching the ball and is still going to be extended at the moment of contact. There's also going to be some ulnar deviation. In other words, the wrist is going to be going towards the right. So if you take a look from this angle, the wrist is slightly extended and is going to the right. This is true for all high level serves. And again, why is this the case? Well, if we made contact with the wrist completely straight, this would be a very weak contact. And you remember that serves accelerate faster than any other strokes in tennis. And if we were holding a racket like this at a moment of contact, we will be very sloppy and very weak. By naturally extending the wrist backwards a little bit, we are able to handle the impact of the ball and provide stability to the racket head. And guys, if you're interested in finding out what exactly happens to the wrist on all the tennis strokes, check out my series, The Role of the Wrist. I'm gonna put a link in the description below. So you're probably asking yourself, Nick, if I'm not supposed to hold the racket loosely, am I supposed to grip it super tight? Absolutely not. Do not grip the racket too tight. Uh, this will restrict the movements. It will make strokes too rigid. So you shouldn't be too loose. You shouldn't be too tight either. You should hold the racket on all strokes except the one-handed back you need to have a spreading between the index finger and the middle finger this is super important also you want to hold the racket as low 
as possible with the pinky towards the edge and the end of the racket inside your hand. This will not make your wrist rigid because the wrist will have to move in different positions throughout the strokes. This is super important that the wrist is not rigid, or in other words, locked. The wrist has to be able to move. And this holding of the racket, and the way I described it, will allow the wrist to move in all the different directions. And one test that you can do either by yourself or with another person is basically trying to push the racket back. So if I hold the racket too loosely, I can easily push the racket backwards and now the racket comes out of my hand. Now there are some players that hold the racket so loosely that the, the bottom of the grip is not even touching the inside of their hand. And this is definitely not something that you wanna do. So the easy test is you push on your strings and if your hand is holding the racket, you will not be able to push the racket back. If you're holding it too loose, you will be able to push it back quite easily. So guys, the students that come to me often bring up uh, these four things when it comes to a loose wrist. So they think that with a loose wrist, they can achieve a better racket drop on the serve, they can achieve pronation into the contact and continuing pronation, and they also believe that they can achieve a proper wrist lag on the forehand if they have a loose and relaxed wrist. And like I said in this video, it is absolutely untrue. You gotta remember that all those things are a direct result of the proper fundamentals and stroke acceleration. If you relax your wrist too much on the forehand and the serve, you will not only lose control, but you will also lose acceleration. And by the way, it is by no means a guarantee that the technical elements that you're trying to achieve by relaxing are going to happen in the first place.